Hi, Tom. Hello, Ethan. I heard like whispers and muffles, and I was like, it says it's starting in 15 seconds, but I know someone's listening. <laughs> really? Someone. That was probably me going like, because <sighs> we are doing a uh, webinar session, winter edition. Um, hi, friends. Welcome. Um, Tom, will you, will you come up with our check-in question today? Sure. Be on the spot. Yes, indeed. I should. I should have. I should have seen this coming. I don't. I don't have a good one. Um, the one I. You can use totally use one of our go-to questions if you want to. I think I'm going to go with one that's kind of like end of the year themed. You know, we're midway through December. You know, a lot of times people come up with New Year's resolutions. So like maybe starting to think about that, um, and like you know planting a seed so that when in two weeks time you have some idea of maybe something you either a want to have a resolution about or b you're really looking forward to next year awesome does that sound good great yeah i like it i'll, I'll put the simple version of like what's something you're looking forward to so one something you would like to maybe you know resolve to do <laughs> maybe it's something that you're like i am looking forward to committing to this <laughs> or it's just something that you're looking forward to as we get into this holiday season and hi, friends. We'll hang for a minute or two while folks get settled into their virtual seats. There's a little poll that came in. So far, we've got 50% students, 30% parents, 20% counselors. We'll do the formal official intro and welcome in just a minute. But let us know in the chat. What are y'all looking forward to? I'm looking forward to, it's my wife's birthday. Um, I think I told you this, Tom, earlier today. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm looking forward to, I have a secret, super secret surprise gift that I haven't told even like I definitely haven't told my daughter because she would have, but I'm super excited to give it to her. And I was just before this session, like kind of doing it. So um, I'm really excited to give this gift to her because I think she's going to love it. And I think I'm going to be like, I'm going to win at husbandhood. Um, what are you excited about, Tom? <laughs> I'm excited to hear about your chocolate party if that does end up happening for her or for yourself. So that's, <laughs> that's one thing I'm looking forward to, just hearing about the rave reviews. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, one thing I'm looking forward to is, and Ethan knows this because we've already talked about this um, in prior conversations, actual human in-person conversations, not just webinar jam, um, which is totally our jam. Um, but one thing I'm really looking forward to is moving to Southern California for the winter. You know, one thing that's great about working with College Essay Guy is we are a fully remote team. We got people in all different corners of the country right now. Um, and it's great that we get to all collaborate. Sometimes it's tricky over certain time zones. Looking at you, Andy, living out in Hawaii. When I was on the East Coast, that made it tough. But um, there is a really nice cohort of us that live in uh, Southern California. And I will be a temporary dweller there for a few months, um, snowbirding in um, LA for until at least May. I have a place rented out there. So um, yeah. Ethan, I'm hoping for game nights at your house. Looking forward Absolutely. to all those good in-person vibes. Absolutely. I'm excited too. Well, here's the official welcome. Hi, friends. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, we're talking about 10 ways to uplevel your college essays and applications right now. Let us know in the chat. I'm assuming that many of you who are students are like applying right now. But if you're not, if you're ninth and 11th grade, let us know that because it, it has helpful for us to know um, who we're talking to. Uh, it looks like from the poll so far, we have 41% of your students, 40% of your parents, and 18% of your counselors. And there's 1% of you. One of you is, is an other. Let us know who you are in the chat. I'm curious. Um, so here's what we're talking about. So first of all, I'm going to go over four ways to know if your application is doing its job. And I will, of course, identify what I believe and what we believe to be the job of the college application. Um, then Tom's going to talk about three things you can do if you've been deferred. So this is a big day in or big week, I should say, uh, in college application world where application acceptances, rejections, and deferrals are coming out. And Tom will define, if you don't know what a deferral is, it's sort of like you're put in the maybe pile, essentially, and it's like, wait, we'll let you know. And it's not a ton of fun, but there are some things that you can do. So Tom's going to talk about those. Then I'm going to talk about two, what are two qualities on your supplemental essays that you should probably demonstrate? And by the way, it's actually three, but it didn't really work with the four, three, two, one thing. Tom and I do love a theme. Um, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna analyze along the way one outstanding application so you can kind of see um, what's, you know, sort of like the bar as it were for applications. And it's a pretty stellar one. 
Um, before we do that, let's just introduce ourselves. I'm Ethan. I'm the college essay guy. I identify, I use he, him pronouns. I identify as a dad and a writer and a teacher and a college basketball fan. And um, I've been thinking about this stuff for like, I don't know, 15 years or so. So I guess I identify as a college counselor too. Tom, well, let's do it. But let's do, let's do our, our, our bio via vis-a-vis -vis identities. Why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So hi, everyone. My name is Tom Campbell. I use he, him pronouns. I identify as a man, uh, Irish American. I actually went to Irish camp my, like, like a lot. And I, I was an Irish dancer. I played the tin whistle. Dia quit. It means hello in Gaelic. I could entertain you with other phrases there, but we only have so much time in a day. Um, I am a hot sauce fiend. That's another identity that is kind of less of a, a lesser known one that not people, unless you see me like sneaking in some Cholula from the side on some webinars, or probably I've done that before. Um, and beyond those things, um, I also do identify as someone who is um, a college admissions, I like to use word, the word that is used on the parent community is expert. And I always feel like that's weird to say, like, I'm an expert. So college admissions experience person. You're an expert, Tom. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Ethan. Um, and I, so I, I got my start in college admissions when I worked at Holy Cross, College of the Holy Cross, which is my alma mater. Um, fabulous Jesuit liberal arts college in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, go Satyrs. Actually, the football team this year is, like, weirdly crushing it. You can, like, Google it. It's amazing. It's blowing records and everyone's freaking out. Um, and Pomona College, where I worked for four years in the admit or just under four years um, in the admissions office there. And then I also have worked as a college counselor at a selective independent school in Seattle. I'm actually here visiting some friends from that school right now. And um, that is why I'm here. Yay. Among other reasons. <laughs> Among other reasons. All right. So we've got, it looks like from the chat, we've got some juniors, we've got some seniors, folks applying now. Some students on gap year. Awesome. Um, you're all welcome. We're glad you're here. So what is the job of the college application? In my view, this is the simple one line version. Of it. If you're a note taker, you can start note taking right now. It's to, uh, to basically share with colleges the skills, qualities, values, and interests that you will bring with you to the college campus. So I'll say it again. What are the skills, the qualities, the values, that, and, and interests, I would say, too, that you're going to bring with you to the college campus? And part of the written parts of your application, which are things like your personal statement, your activities list, your additional information section, which we'll talk about in a minute, and your supplemental essays, part of what you're trying to do is, in the words of our colleague, who I think might be on the session, Susan, is to give life, to give heart to this thing that otherwise would just be numbers and figures. So how do you do that? And that's what we're going to talk about. One of the ways, especially if you're applying right now, is to make sure that you kind of get a bird's eye view of what is all the stuff that you're sending to them. Now, here's why I say this, because I think sometimes when students are working on their applications, you get really close to it and it's hard to see like all the pieces of it. So one of the things that we recommend doing is creating something that we call an almost done document. So four ways to know if your application is doing its job. Number one, create an almost done document. Now, what does an almost done document look like? It's pretty simple. It's your personal statement at the top of the page. And if you're applying right now, literally you can do this right now, but here's an application from a student, past student that I worked with um, who went, got into Columbia. This is her personal statement, which, which I'm gonna go over in just a little bit. And then underneath that, her activities list. Now your activities list, if you're a junior and you're not, uh, you haven't seen what these look like yet, it's got basically a description of, you know, brief description and 150 characters of, you know, each of, the, each of your top activities. Doesn't have to be 10, but there's room for 10. The student submitted eight and still got into a good school. <laughs> Sometimes students are like, oh my gosh, if I don't put 10, it's fine. Then there's the additional information section, which includes stuff that you feel like, you know what, I didn't get a chance to maybe get cover in depth in, in this part mm -hmm. of my application. And then you'll see underneath this, and we'll go over this more in depth in just a few minutes, uh, the supplemental short answers. So in this case, Columbia asks things like, you know, titles of required readings. And they ask for things like, um, by the way, this is from a previous, so these, you know, may not reflect the current prompts. I have to always say that. Uh, but they asked like, why do you want to go to Columbia? And, you know, uh, what is it that led you to be interested in what you're interested in? It's kind of a why major. Now, again, the, the word limit here is 300. They've shortened it since, but you'll get a sense kind of of the spirit of these when we go over this. But essentially, 
the reason I think this is a good idea is that I think that if you can kind of go big picture and go, all right, here are the different sides of me that the school is seeing. So for example, my personal statement, maybe they're learning about my love for clay sculpting. And then in my activities list, they're learning about my extracurricular involvement. They're learning about my, just how deep things went, you know, in terms of my involvement in Boy Scouts or whatever that thing is that you did. And then over in my supplemental essays, I'm not going to write about sculpting or something, you know, or Boy Scouts. I might write about something completely different. Now, is it okay to write in your supplemental essays about stuff you've written in your activities list? Sure. But the, the key to like, and the point of putting the big, putting it all on that one doc is so number one, for yourself, you can sort of do a scan of like, what are the different sides of me that are being revealed? And number two, if you're sharing this with somebody else and you want them to give you some impact, uh, some like some feedback or some input, um, you know, you can basically give them a sense of like, okay, here's everything that the school is saying. I, we like to recommend doing like doing it for one school, like a school that you're really excited about and then do the supplemental essays for other schools underneath it. And I think it's useful to, if you're applying to lots of different schools and sending them different pieces to maybe do an almost done doc per school. I know that can be like tedious if you're making changes, but have like a main one. So like, here's my main almost done doc, but here's the version that I'm sending to this other school because maybe you're switching out some of the essays just based on their supplemental essay requirements. So that's thing number one. Let me pause for a second. Tom, do you have anything else to add about almost done docs? And it's okay if you don't, but I'm just curious. No, I mean, really briefly, I would say even just, it seems like pretty simple. It's like, this is too simple to be a, a tip that can help me. But just visualizing the different elements of your application together and being like, gee, I never mentioned this amazing, you know, garden making indoor thing that I have. I'm, I'm looking at my friend who has this like indoor garden thing that's amazing. I never even mentioned that anywhere in my application. So you'll, you'll be able to see just opportunities that may be lacking um, in a much more easy to read format than the different tabs on the common app where you're like, what did I write about for this school where? And um, it definitely just kind of helps take that stake of, okay, are all the things that are most integral to me being reflected here? So um, just the formatting of it in itself, I think is really beneficial to visually tackle that challenge. Yeah, and it'll only take you like, you know, five minutes to do that. You just copy and paste the things on there. It's gonna help you with editing. Some students I've seen will just put all stuff only in the common app and they won't have like a place where they can edit separately. So I just highly recommend doing that mm -hmm. on a Google doc, really easy. Okay, number one. Number two. Ask yourself, is your activities li list up-leveled? And what do I mean by up-leveled? Take a look. This is the one, the example that I'm, I'm sharing, that I showed you earlier. So this student has co-head of United Cultures, this is a club at the student school, organize student forums, speaker series, expeditions, constantly coordinate with school administration, co-design all school diversity workshops. Some things to notice about this. Notice the active verbs, organize. Uh, coordinate, not just coordinate, constantly coordinate, uh, co-design all school diversity workshops. I like the attention to like, not just design, but like co-design, you know, giving props to your co-coordinator, whoever that is. Um, notice that these first ones that are listed here have co-head and captain. Uh, I really love it when students have those first, you know, the first activities do demonstrate some leadership. So if someone's skimming, you know, there's like some cool, oh yeah, cool, this, this student has got some leadership opportunities. You know, notice again the verbs, danced, lead, guide, encourage. What I like about this is that it's showing different sides of the student, collaborate. And if I'm thinking about what values is it revealing, I see creativity, I see leadership, I see engagement, I see ability to work with others. One of the things I'm really looking for when I'm scanning an application is do I see evidence that this student is someone that I'm gonna like to work with? And then I want, you know, this is gonna be a team player essentially. Tom, what do you like to see on activities lists? Or what are some missteps that you see students make sometimes? The missteps that I have seen are when a when an activity is is on the more self-explanatory end, a lot of times, not to make stereotypes, but like this, it tends to be athletics. Sometimes the things that people will put are like pretty expected. And in fact, actually one time I've used this example on several webinars, so apologies if it's a repeat, but I did have one time a student whose one activity was basketball and for his 150 word description, he wrote self-explanatory. <laughs> so while, while I props to you and like true, you know, most people will know what basketball entails and you don't need to necessarily do the mechanics of like the ball goes up and down and I move it with my hand and shoot it at baskets. Um, actually, some kind of like playful use of that, that description can make a lot of sense. So my biggest advice with like up leveling your activities list is to look at your list and see 
some of the some of the activities that you have may may require some explanation. It may be a, a unique initiative or a leadership position that like to be able to demonstrate all the awesome co-leading that you're doing and the constant collaboration with administration. Mentioning that in the description really does help you show what you how you spent your time doing this activity. If it is one that is self more self-explanatory, you can use that as an opportunity to be a little more playful and be a little more original and creative with the way that you're sharing your contributions there. So I use I use these kind of analogies a lot, but like, are you like the mom of the team bringing the band-aids to practice because you know that Timmy is always tripping? Like, or are you the one who's cooking the pasta at the pasta parties and like you make sure that's gluten free and regular because mm -hmm. you want to be inclusive? You know, th those are things that like a mixture of kind of more serious, like, you know, ball, like baller activities and kind of like, yeah, I'm like really good at this and I, you know, want to hype up my awesomeness with this leadership or this initiative. And then it's okay to kind of have ebbs and flows of kind of more of those, I guess, like meaty, robust um, descriptions. And then ones that can be more lighthearted and playful. If that's your style, some students are like, I know, I know kids who talk like that. And that's just not my, that's not my gig. So don't force something that feels inauthentic, but I do give you the permission to um, have those kind of layers and levels to your activities, depending on how much explanation is needed and how to, how creative you can be with that opportunity. So number one, almost done, Doc. Number two, a good solid activities list. And in the chat, I'm going to share with you a little link to a great guide that we put together on how to write an awesome activities list. Um, there's a fun, I think, I mean, hopefully it's fun. I don't know, uh, guide to like, there's a little YouTube video there. Actually, you know what? I'm going to let Ashley do that. Ashley, our star moderator, will put that link in there. But it's a guide to like up leveling your activities list. Number three is your additional information section. Have you, if you have things that you feel like need a little bit more explanation, I want to just encourage you to use that space. Sometimes this is kind of an ambiguous space, and students are like, I don't know what goes here. So I want to just give you some examples. I don't want you to think that if you didn't put anything there when you first applied early decision, early action, you did something wrong because students, let me, let me say this twice. Students get into great schools every year with empty additional info sections. It is okay. You do not have to put anything here, but if you've got extra stuff to share, sometimes it's cool to use this section. So for example, the student had this global studies thing listed. Well, what is global studies? Well, this student put an active member in the hour. Whoops. Look at that, a typo. Wait a minute, does that mean the student's not getting into Columbia? And I didn't notice that that was there, but I just wanna point out that like, if you do have a typo, it's probably not the end of the world. So quick side tip, you're okay. Like I've seen, I've actually been on conversations with, I'll just, I'm not gonna clarify it was a student or a parent, but what, the person was in tears worrying that this is, that the student that was, and that student ended up at a great, great school mm -hmm. um, with a typo. Uh, so anyway, my point here is that it's okay. Try not to have too many typos, but active member in our school's ethics and global studies program since ninth grade. Cool. Shows longevity. Participated in global ethnic and culture classes and spearheaded discussions in cultural diversity and globalization trends. Cool. So this is giving me some more context that maybe didn't fit in the activities list. Mm -hmm. Also, this student had some scholastic arts and writing awards. Now, your award section, technically it says academic honors. If you want to include some other awards you can totally put those in the additional info it's totally fine uh food blog so the student created a food blog in 2017 uh posted 50 plus entries gained 300 plus followers a few articles had 2000 plus readers this is cool evidence of impact it's numbers showing that like hey people were actually reading this some of you have social media followings and or you're, you're you know you're posting stuff that you know stuff that you really care about sharing how many followers you've got could be awesome People are going to ask how many followers is okay. It's it's up to you. Your 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 choice. Um, one. Yes. One. Your mom. <laughs> my mom. My mom is my biggest follower. Um, uh, there's also you know in this situation a student had a family situation that she wanted to talk about. So my mother's stage four endometrial cancer impacted my family significantly, and since neither of my parents experienced any formal U.S. education, I navigated my academics on my own. So here's just a brief mention of something that really had a big impact on this student's life. This is mentioned briefly in her personal statement, which we'll get to in just a minute. But right now it's just like, hey, this is the thing that impacted me. Sometimes students will put things in here that's like, you know, I have stage blank hearing loss, but it doesn't have a huge impact on me, but it's just another part of something that I'm navigating. Um, so if you feel like you want to include something to just give them a broader picture of who you are, I think it's okay. Um, things that are like extenuating circumstances, like our school canceled all AP courses this year. That might be an interesting thing. 
um, because they didn't want, a lot of schools are doing this now, especially in DC. There was a big a article that came out this week about canceling AP, you know, the APs. Um, Self-taught psychology and took the AP psych exam sophomore year. You could put your score here or you could just let it speak for itself elsewhere in the application. And then, yeah, some additional honors that she included. So hopefully this gives you an idea. And again, I, I don't want to freak y'all out thinking that you have to put stuff here, but hopefully it gives you an idea of like some other things that you could include in that in that section if you haven't done it elsewhere. Um, I want to jump to the next one, which is like, is your personal statement crushing it? And what do I mean by crushing it? There are four qualities that I look for. And this is the note taking part. If you want to take notes, um, it's, you know, is your personal, dem uh, personal statement demonstrating core values, insight, craft, and vulnerability. And let me try and point those out with an example from this student's essay, because I think it's a lovely one. Now, quick backstory. This student totally had another essay that she worked on for a long time. And then before she submitted, like a couple weeks, honestly, before submitting, she got feedback from her counselor that she didn't feel like it was vulnerable enough and personal enough. Mm -hmm. and she was like, you know what? I think it's true. And I looked at it and I was like, yeah, I think you're right. So we jammed work <laughs> over the course of a week. It was a frantic week, but she rewrote it and it came out, I think, beautifully. It was much more vulnerable and personal. So here's her essay. I'm going to read it to you. And along the way, I'm going to point out these four qualities. And just to remind you what they are, it's values, insight, craft, and vulnerability. There's no like order to these, you know, like one is better than the other. It's just four things that we tend to see in great personal statements. About a decade ago, a teacher asked me, what would be the first thing you'd include if you were building a city? Without hesitation, I said, an airport. I grew up traveling between Beijing and San Francisco and around the world. But amid the hustle and bustle, the smell of stir-fried bok choy in 5 p.m. elevators and turkeys jostling along our morning walks to Emerald Glen Park in Pleasanton, California, my mother was the constant. So there's family. My mother was the constant. I called both China and America home, but felt most at home in her presence. So I'm hearing like stability there. But I left my mother too. Three years ago, I passed through the familiar Beijing airport, but to an unfamiliar place, the Besant Hill School in Ojai, California. Holding an American passport, I arrived as an international student and often felt as if I was the other. That's when home became my mother's voice. Though disturbed by intermittent coughs that immediately that immediately recognizable sound remained tender and serene. And despite the unease in my questions about her chemotherapy, I found and find refuge in her voice, the place of comfort and strength, warmth and familiarity. Still searching for a sense of belonging. So what's starting to emerge is a theme, like where does she find anchors? Where does she find homes? And she's searching for a sense of belonging. Beyond those Friday night calls, I began keeping a food blog. In my posts, I described the taste of sweet and sour pork in Hangzhou, ruminating on Jiling Bridge, which I walked by. With Ling Ji, my, my hidden middle name, I wondered if I found some ancestry in that city. So you're seeing that she's sort of weaving in elements of her culture that seem important to her. So some more values here. Soon I discovered another piece of home in New York City's Chelsea Market too, while licking fresh strawberry gelato and watching the crowds pass by. Now these details are what I would call craft. This really helps to bring the essay to life. So it's not just like, I wrote a food blog. It's like, here are the things I was writing about and the things I was tasting and seeing and experiencing. Through food, I often felt more connected with people and places around the world. Somehow those sensory experiences, the taste, smell, texture, the look of a morsel, and even the surrounding air triggered certain memories and a burst of rose-tinted nostalgia. That's a really lovely, well-crafted phrase. So that's an example for me of, of craft. Yeah. The vulnerability I'm hearing too, and like just sharing these details about this, you know, she doesn't super get into the, the struggle here, but she hints at a challenge here with her mom. And something never felt right. Okay, here's some more vulnerability. Perhaps those romanticized feelings began to resemble home only because I was constantly moving, yearning for home. Maybe it was my eagerness to confirm that home could reside in the mind that made me see it everywhere I went. But could these feelings and thoughts truly constitute a home? Now, this is some deep critical thinking where she's questioning her own suppositions. She's questioning her own assumptions here. She's like, yes, these things were home for me, but were they really? So she goes deeper. Intrigued, I sought to find a more concrete connection to the physical place in which I lived. So now there's kind of a journey that she's on, searching for home, searching for belonging. And that to me is well craft, is craft, evidence of craft. 
Last year, I developed a photojournalism project aimed at aiming to capture the people and stories of Ojai to connect myself and my school, my school community to our town. I interviewed the owner of an organic family restaurant, enjoying stories about his favorite purple cauliflower. Notice the details. I met Kate, the baker of a gourmet bread shop, and learned about her eight-year-old daughter's love of fig pudding. People with whom I used to share a quick hello became the touchstones of home. Surprisingly, along the way, I also discovered that some residents didn't exactly see themselves belonging to our town. A mid-50s steelworker conveyed his struggle understanding Ojai's upscale hipster culture. Oziel, the adored burrito maker, still finds more solace in his original Latinx community. I could relate. Now, what's keeping me engaged, too, is like, is this student going to find home or not? While I can trace connections to so many places, literal and figurative, I, too, have found it difficult to feel connected to a permanent place. So where is my home? Perhaps art can be my home. Through photographs and paintings, I perceive and connect with the world through color, light, and detail. By the way, this is what she wanted to study. As I work to reveal my subconscious thoughts and unadulterated self. In dance, focusing my breath with others, I sync with the ensemble and truly own my physical presence. Then again, perhaps for me, airport really is the best answer. It's the in-between space, the crossroads of the world, a place full of people longing for home, people coming to and going from home, where I seem to belong. While I continue to seek answers, striving to understand my own and others' place in this world, you can look for me at both arrivals and departures. So there's a lot to, we could spend totally another half hour on this session. That, I think it's so good. Yeah, I wanna kick it over to Tom in just a minute, okay. but just to highlight some of these qualities, the values. This is a student who clearly is connected to her family. She's clearly connected to culture and many cultures. She's an artist. So I'm seeing her creative side come through. She's also a deep thinker, right? I, if I name one of her values, it would be like introspection or reflection. Insights are throughout, you know, the insight that she is truly this critical thinker, insights into the way that she is thinking about belonging. I see craft in lots of different ways, you know, little use of dialogue here. There's nice sentence variety. There's lots of details and vulnerability. This is a student who has questions and she, you know, is searching, she's searching and she hasn't totally figured it out, right? There's like this sense at the end of like, yeah, she hasn't landed on like a pat answer. And my sense is that she's okay with that ambiguity. And that's a sign of like a great sign of maturity. So to me, this is a really solid personal statement. And hopefully as you're sort of thinking about your own essay, I'm not saying you should compare your essay to this, do not do that. But these qualities and these examples will hopefully inspire and maybe, you know, and, and inspire you to think about what, you know, what other possibilities are there for your personal statement? Okay, Tom, I'm going to kick it over to you to talk a little bit about deferrals and what deferrals even are. Sure thing. Yeah. The what last thing I'll mention just about that essay is um, as I was kind of reading through it. So shout out to Alex Bryson. He is our operations king at CEG and he led us through a session on nonviolent communication, which has a lot to do with identifying how you're feeling in a moment and what you needed in that moment. And that's an exercise called feelings and needs that college essay guy has where even her, this student, I don't know who they are, but um, them writing, you know, I was feeling romantic about things and I realized I needed a home setting set up for such like a vulnerable and personal experience. So I put the link in the chat to that exercise in case it resonates. If that particular part of the essay resonates with you, um, chances are there's a way for you to be able to fold in a similar um, introspection and kind of like self-reflection into your own work. But switching gears to deferrals, which is the reason I was, uh, the reason I'm here, um, among many, uh, repeat line. Um, so deferrals, yeah. Um, what this term, this term actually, there's two kind of versions of it. One is if a student um, is admitted to a school, but then they just said they want to defer for a year or take a gap year. That's not what we're talking about today because we're living in the moment and, and, and reading, meeting you all where you're at. So uh, many of you, I imagine, are um, current seniors. Uh, we know uh, at least 39% uh, of you are students who are tuning in and also parents and counselors who inevitably are supporting students who maybe they applied early action or early decision to a college this year. Um, and they maybe received one of three decisions, um, possibly four. Um, one of those may have been that they were admitted to that school, which is great and very exciting, and you can do a happy dance. Um, maybe the other is that the student was not admitted, and obviously that's really not happy and, and, and a difficult thing to process and work through. Um, and then there's a third, a lot more nebulous um, decision that doesn't have quite that finite, okay, this is the end of the road for me, like a denial would. 
And that's a deferral. So basically what this means is students are deferred from instead of being evaluated in the context of the early application round with other students who also applied at that same time and through that same round, they're being evaluated in context with others through the regular decision pool. That's typically how most schools will do it. But again, it does depend on the school. Um, and if you are a student or if you are a parent or a counselor guiding a student through that first, I really just wanna say, this is a big day for many college um, decision releases. Many schools release around mid-December. And in fact, we know from the students that we work with at College Essay Guy that today in particular, um, have a lot of schools have released decisions this evening. So if you're tuning in um, and you have just received a college decision, regardless of what option it is, I really hope that what we share with you today can help you move forward in a healthy and productive way um, and maximize your um, chances of being admitted to maybe this particular college that maybe you were deferred from, um, but also recognizing the reality of, of math and the data kind of behind deferrals um, and what this can mean for your candidacy and keeping an open mind with the other options that you have in play. So with that, my three tips, if you are deferred, are regroup, reevaluate, and re-engage. Okay, so regroup. I kind of touched on this a little bit, but deferrals are tough. Um, at many, especially of the more highly selective, or as I like to call them, highly rejective colleges and universities, the number of students that they defer tends to be far, far larger than they could ever admit. Um, so at a lot of these schools, um, you know, such as the Ivies and the Stanfords of the world, this is, it's a little different from school to school, so I'm just putting that out there. Um, but in any of these places, they may be admitting over half of their early decision pool. Um, and usually at a lot of these schools, uh, around 10% or so or less are eventually admitted through regular decision. So again, all of you have applied to different schools, your lists look differently, um, but definitely on that more highly rejected end, it does tend to be the numbers don't necessarily provide a lot of comfort and a lot of optimism about what's to come. There are always students who do get in. There are students who are part of that 10 to 20%, whatever it may be. So um, still definitely going forward with that school's process and doing it in a way that makes sense for your own health and well-being and for your own um, goals that you want to achieve in college is definitely really the way to think about this. But um, take that time to really kind of be in those feelings because it feels it feels strange. It feels strange to kind of have a door that hasn't been completely shut, but it's just a jar and you don't quite know how how wide that threshold is right now. Um, and that ambiguity and lack of clarity can be really just difficult to to sit with. Um, so take those feelings and acknowledge that and, and take that time to regroup and recharge. And whether that's a weekend or a week, um, there's no need to kind of spring to action right away when you get this news. Um, you also possibly are applying to other colleges at this time. Um, so prioritizing your time to make sure that your application is the best that it can be um, for other schools that may be on your list is I'd say a, a better use of your time than diving immediately into chasing after a school or schools that you may have been deferred from. So definitely regrouping is a big one that I want to, want to emphasize. Um, but then once you've taken that time to, to regroup and collect yourself back up to be able to get to work, that's when you're gonna to wanna to enter into tip number two, which is to reevaluate. Um, and by reevaluate, what I don't mean is like panic that this is going to be your fate at every school and that there must be something terribly wrong with my application and it's full of deficits and that's the reason I didn't get in. Really kind of doing that chancing and what ifing of why didn't it work out, as difficult as it is going to be, spending your time doing that, the application has already been submitted and chances are you put together a really great application. And it probably, if you were deferred, it means that the college, see, you have the grades, you have elements about you that they are, are, make you a completely admissible candidate. If you weren't, they would have denied you. So there are things about you that they saw enough in you to keep you in the running and to right. keep you in context with other students in the regular pool. So really recognizing and acknowledging that and not, tr not pinching yourself and kind of dissecting your application to see and notice where the flaws are. Now, if you did, you know, Tune into the if you did tune into the early part of the session, Ethan's wisdom, you know, kind of going through your application and looking at those four areas and seeing, gee, okay, maybe there are some opportunities. Maybe I didn't fill out my additional info when I applied to these schools in November. Maybe I do want to kind of expand on a few of my activities or areas that I, I really poured a lot of time and energy into this club. And I realize now that like I only wrote 150 characters about it and I'd love to expand on it. Definitely use utilizing your application and kind of maximizing some of the the tools that Ethan just shared with you 
you can definitely do that. But I would say going back and revising your personal statement or kind of really kind of re-envisioning your entire application is not what I'd recommend doing with your time. Um, but when I say reevaluate, I mean reevaluate kind of how you are feeling and kind of how you're feeling about that particular school. You know, are you crushed and devastated? And you're like, I really want to do as much as I can to maximize my chances there. Great. There's definitely some things that you can do in terms of advocacy that I'll share with in, in part three, which is re-engage. Um, but in the reevaluation stage, you know, ask yourself, what were the things about this school that I applied early to that sold me on it? Was it the location? Do I realize that I really want to be, the more I researched the school, the more I got to know about it, the more I realized I wanted to live in LA. Relatable, right? Um, is it the programs that they have? Do they have a unique approach to their curriculum? Is there, you know, something about it? Is there a particular um, approach to the schedule? Is it, do I really like the idea that it's a quarter system instead of a semester system? And like, I really want schools that look like that. Kind of taking stock of your priorities and, you know, we have great tools that we um, like to hype up, like Corsava, which is a great um, uh, way to be able to take stock of those priorities and build a college list that really identifies, okay, what are the things that are must-haves for me? And looking at that school you were deferred from and being like, okay, there are other schools that have a lot of these must-have qualities that aren't this school. Are those on my list? And if not, maybe I'll put them on, right? Um, so taking that time to reevaluate why you fell in love with that school in the first place and realizing that there's 2000 plus colleges and universities to choose from. And um, there are some schools like College of the Atlantic, which is a marine biology paradise in small Bar Harbor, Maine, or the Warren Wilsons of the world in, you know, Western North Carolina that are super original and have a completely different approach. But a lot of schools have a very, very similar, a lot of small liberal arts colleges other than the location offer a similar approach, similar curriculum, similar outcomes and opportunities. And so I think finding those ones that you really centered on and, and made you fall in love with that early school to begin with is really what I'd encourage you to do in that reevaluation stage. You also might be in the camp where you reevaluate. And I had students last year who were like, you know, actually I thought I was gonna be crushed, but when I applied in November, I thought I was like totally into the school. And then I kind of started to be a little more on the fence about it and realized that after taking AP Bio as a senior, I really actually want to, prioritize schools that have a marine bio, bio program, maybe College of the Atlantic. That really is something that I've, I've leaned into a lot more in the month and a half or two months since I sent in my application. So you may be in that camp as well. And so leaning into kind of the way that you're feeling about the deferral and that emotional reaction and either trying to find more schools that fit, fit that vision and goals or pivoting and adding in more schools and different approaches that maybe the Tom of two months ago would never have thought of. But the third one is going to be regroup or no regroup. We already went over that. That was number one. Number three is going to be re-engage. So after you have been in your fields, you've regrouped, you've, you've gone back on the horse, you've reevaluated that you want to either lean into schools similar to where you were deferred, or you want to pivot your, your options and, and maybe expand your list. Um, I do recommend modifying your list if you don't have enough likely schools. We're really big on encouraging students to Make sure that they have enough schools where they are likely to be admitted, especially if you don't have an option locked and in play at this stage in your process. You haven't heard back a, a yes decision. Once you get that, um, it's such a sigh of relief to be able to have a school that you're like, I know I'm going to college. Um, of course, you know, I have other options you may be applying to, but I do recommend really making sure your, your list has enough likely schools. Um, but then with the re-engagement phase, it's it's engaging with the school that you've school or schools that you've been deferred to in an intentional and meaningful way. And my biggest piece of advice with that is to follow instructions. So colleges give really typically specific instructions in your um, decision letter that will outline the ways that you can continue to engage with the particular college. And again, students are deferred for a wide variety of reasons. Sometimes it's because the college wants to see updated academic performance from senior year. Maybe there were some rocky parts to their junior year or earlier where they want to see how are they handling this most demanding and challenging program as a senior. Um, and th it could be that there's a lot of other compelling things about them, but that was the piece that maybe, you know, they wanted to see more time and more engagement with that, right? Um, maybe they just were heavy on e early decision and they had to defer a lot of students. Whatever the reason and rationale may be, spending time kind of thinking about that is, is not what I would recommend doing. I'd recommend you channel your energies on the things that you can control, which are showing continued interest in the school um, and continuing to stay engaged in what you have told them and kind of what you've shared with them are the things that you're doing. 
It's not adding clubs. It's not trying to be like, I got to find a leadership position because that was the deficit. And so I'm going to try to last minute come up with the club in two months. No, 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 no. You have, you're, you're, you're doing a lot. <laughs> you're doing, you're crushing it. You're doing great things. And the things that you are crushing were the thing, the reasons why you are still in the running and the reasons why you're deferred. Right. So I think remembering that and not kind of just adding more to your plate, that is definitely not what you're going to do in this re-engagement stage. You are going to reiterate that you're continuing to crush it. And so you're going to reiterate that. And then you're also going to try as hard as you can um, to continue doing that. Um, and of course, you're human. If you stumble and trip, you know, a class or two here or there, it's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean that your college process is over. But those are the two biggest things that I recommend doing um, to maximize your chances, staying um, engaging with your grades and um, staying engaged um, and invested in the things that you care about and the things that really fill your cup. And in terms of a letter of continued interest, that is the communication that is kind of like the gold standard, unless a college specifies, we don't want a letter of continued interest, or we want you to submit it through your application portal, or we have video responses that you can do. I, in fact, my colleague or former colleague, Rochelle, who just did a session in our parent community, shout out for the parent community, um, just an hour before this, um, at Claremont McKenna, they invite students to do a video response and send that in as part of their deferral. And they only defer a few students, but really reading the instructions on what's available to you as an opportunity to stay engaged. Um, many colleges don't evaluate demonstrated interest or don't factor it in in their general application process. But once a student is deferred or eventually possibly once a student is waitlisted, that kind of goes out of the way and you, you do want to actually show them that you're still interested in it. You still would want to enroll because oftentimes, sometimes there are a few schools that will defer students because they're not quite sure how interested they are. Tulane is one example that comes to mind. Um, so with the letter of um, with the letter of continued interest, what you want to do is, and actually I can share the letter in the chat, or actually put it in the show notes so you can be able to check it out later. Um, this is what a letter generally looks like. So if you can see this, okay, yeah, okay. Um, and the letter is right here from Ms. Zola Avery. And basically the things that you want to communicate in this letter, it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to mail it to the school typically. Um, again, follow the instructions on their um, this, your decision letter about how to send these types of communications in. But this first one, you can usually send it sometime in January. There's no rush to do it, as I said before, right away while you're in your fields and you're super emotional after you've reflected, spending some time in January after you've submitted your regular decision apps, really kind of leaning into um, uh, communicating your interest to your deferred school. So um, the things that she mentions are, you know, who she is, that she was deferred and that she's still really interested in the school. Um, she's also gonna mention things that she's done during her current time as a senior since since she's applied, she's still engaged with things that she's involved in and she's gone on to these cool conferences. So she wants to share that with the admissions office and that's completely, definitely great. And in fact, she's sharing coincidentally a touch point with the school that she was deferred with, Yale, um, which if you have personal touch points, maybe you interviewed with the school since you applied as an early applicant. Maybe you got to chat with an alum or someone from your high school who went and you got to hear more about what was available there. Those types of um, personal touch points with the school, if you have had them since you applied, great to include it because you don't want to just recycle or regurgitate if the school had like a why us essay. You don't want to just say the same thing that you already had mentioned in your application pre previously. You want to identify new touch points with the school and new points of pride that you've experienced in high school. So the letter continues to kind of go on in mentioning a few awards, a few areas um, academically that the student is really interested in, looks like an interest in fusing kind of together uh, literature and STEM, which is super cool. Um, and kind of, again, at the last paragraph, reiterating the interest there um, and you know ensuring them that they would be you know thrilled to attend if they would reevaluate the candidacy. Um, so that's a real quick look over that. Again, we have this resource for you to kind of take a look at if you are a deferred student to, um, to put your best foot forward with these types of communications. That letter of, continued interest typically can be sent out in January. And unless the school specifies otherwise, my biggest recommendation is to send a monthly communication to your regional admissions officer. That's enough that you're showing that you're still engaged. So if you send one in February and one in early March, it can be a short, quick little paragraph being like, hey, it's me again, still really interested. Here are a few things I've, I've been really into. Um, I'm really hoping for a positive results with the regular decision process. Short and sweet, doesn't need to be the same length as that 
initial letter of continued interest, which maybe is going to be about, you know, 500 or so words, two, three paragraphs or so, I'd say is a good length. Um, but unless the school tells you otherwise, I'd say a monthly engagement with your regional admissions officer is a great way to show that you're still engaged, you still attend, um, and cross your fingers for it to work out, but also recognize that there are many colleges out there that would be very, very lucky to have you. This, <laughs> what Tom said, I'm just like, in, I'm virtual emoji chat, yes. Um, sure. Let's, so two things that, like just to jump to the two things that I feel like are good to think about when you're thinking about your supplemental essay. So this is for students who are like now, you know, you're applying right now, or maybe you're a year out and you're thinking about applying. Um, and this goes for transfer students who somebody mentioned they're a transfer student. Two things that I think it's really important to show. And one of them Tom's already mentioned, which is interest, like demonstrating that you're really interested in the school and related to that is like, you know, we could call that fit, like that you would, you know, truly fit in the inside the campus. And I'll show you in just a second what I mean like by that. And the second one is like, I think it's important to have some kind of connection to your personal statement. Now, I don't think this is 100% of the time true. Sometimes someone will write about something in their personal statement and write about something else in their activity or in their additional info or sorry, their supplemental essay. And it'll be different and that's okay. So it's not like it has to be like perfect, you know, tongue and groove, like, oh, okay, I see perfectly how this connects. But I think it can be nice. I think there are some situations where students write about one thing and they don't even mention it all in their supplemental essays. And so it's a little bit like, well, how do these things fit together in your world? How do these things feel in a word cohesive? So let me show you a cool example of this from that same applicant that we've been looking at. Here we are. So this student is writing a Why Columbia essay. Now it's longer than, it, now it's shorter than it used to be, but this is when it was 300 words. This was a couple of years ago. I wanna see, feel, and understand humanity across cultures. Now remember, this is a student who we already know has been searching for home, belonging, is thinking about cultures. At Columbia, she writes, I'd focus on art history while exploring urban studies and social justice. Now, I love that the student number one is naming the things that she'd be interested in. There are specific departments. And they might be, it might be that these are departments that are in particular studies that are not at every single school. I look at some of these and I'm like, or art history, yeah, probably at most schools, but urban studies and social justice, yeah, there, there will be elements of those things, but okay, this is starting to get a little bit more specific. And part of what you're trying to do is to set, um, set yourself apart, obviously, but also set the school apart from other schools that you're interested in. So what specifically at Columbia would this student engage with? First of all, she says, I believe obtaining a broader vision of different populations through art is fundamental to understanding humanity and can lend insights into global issues. So now she's given a little mission statement. Here's why I love art. Columbia, with its unparalleled interactions with the arts and cultures of NYC and the globe, would enable me to do exactly that. So she's like, I want to understand the world better, but through this lens or these lenses. Having produced a research paper on street art in NYC and curated a Bolivia, I know this is really ridiculous, curated an exhibition, I'd be excited to see firsthand the connections between creative individuals and their surroundings by attending La Casa Pacific, Latinx artists coast to coast. Learning from professor, this particular professor, an activist and curator, I delve into how art encourages marginalized groups, self-expression and activist efforts. So here's the simple thing to do. What's the specific thing you want at the school and how is it gonna up-level your learning? Through Columbia's unique global core classes like this particular course and study abroad opportunities like this particular opportunity. So my point here is that if you just say, I wanna take courses and study abroad, right? What specifically at the school that you're interested in do you wanna study? And then again, part two, how does it up-level you? I could immerse myself in different cultures, visual expressions, examine their social and political conditions and gain firsthand curating experience. Now, again, particular opportunities are gonna up-level you in a particular way. Additionally, the courses like this and this would help me further comprehend urban issues like gentrification. So again, you can kind of see the repetition here of like this, this format, but it works super well. And I get a sense that this student has really done her research, that she's gonna be a fit for Columbia just based on all the things that Columbia does. Um, and it's, it's super clear and it's also well-structured. Notice that she says here, she did end up visiting the school and she says, standing on the steps, I felt at home. So it's like, is this her real home? <laughs> so there is kind of a thing. <laughs> Could it be? I kind of pointed that out and she's like, yeah, she's like, I feel okay with it. I was like, okay. She's like, I really did feel it. I'm like, okay. I mean, it's something that a lot of students say, but oh, this student had a portfolio as well. But let me show you one more essay. Oh, this is like her project. Okay. 
So the, the other thing in terms of you know demonstrating cohesion, I'm not going to go over this whole thing just so we have lots of time for Q&A, but essentially she gives a clear sense of like, what is it about art that she loves? So she talks about this paper. Yes, she's mentioned it elsewhere, but she talks about how it delves into art's potential to connect many individuals, which is a theme for, you know, in her personal statement and even in her, her Why Columbia essay. She talks about this, you know, Bolivia photojournalism showcase that she's worked in. And she talks about how last summer in Beijing, she curated this exhibit. Now, do these things repeat a little bit? Yes, they do. But she's kind of, you know, beating the drum for like, hey, I am an artist. I'm interested in cultures. This is who I am. This is who you're getting, if you're getting me. And it's in some ways kind of focused. Now, do I believe that absolutely everybody's application needs to have a cohesive like through line and needs to be like, oh, you are X in a very specific describable way? Not necessarily. I think it did help this student. She was an international student applying and it's really hard to get into Columbia if you're an international student applying. Um, I think it's even harder, you know, to get into highly rejected schools. But I think that having that cohesive thing and, and having a somewhat uncommon focus, I think was helpful for her. Again, I want to step, walk it back. Do I think that every student needs an uncommon focus? Not necessarily. There are ways to stand out that don't involve like picking a, an obscure combination of majors. But this is truly what she was interested in. And I think it, it did help her yeah. kind of jump out of the pile in addition to all the other things that we've been talking about that, that I feel like she did really well. Yeah. Um, so we've got about nine minutes and I wanted to do some, I do like to do rapid fire Q&A. Um, but before we do that, quick PSAs. Somebody asked in the chat, um, do you review essays? There are two ways that if you're interested in support in these next couple of weeks, there's like the, you know, and I'll have Ashley put in links to this. We do have like an essay review platform. So if you have like a single essay that you'd like to get feedback on, we can do that. We also have like whole common app reviews that Tom himself does. Um, we've got, he's one of a couple of reviewers who do those. And essentially you can just get your whole application reviewed and get a sense of like, here are the things that you could be working on, things that you could be thinking about. It's pretty comprehensive. It's pretty cool. And then if you're interested in engaging even more deeply, more consistently, we also have a few spots for students who want to just, you know, work with us for as many sessions as we can like basically get in uh, over the next couple of weeks, uh, you know, until the applications are due. We don't want to stress anybody out, but do we do want to offer that as a paid option if somebody's, if you're interested in that. So we'll put in links to that to the chat if you're interested. And I welcome questions on that if you if you want. But let's get into the questions that you were asking. Um, and maybe we just take turns. Let me, I'm gonna grab the activities list ones. Somebody asked, can we talk about activities in middle school? I would say keep it mostly to high school stuff, unless it's something that you started in middle school and then continued in high school. So if you've been like a clarinet player since the fourth grade, you could put fourth grade to 12th grade clarinet player. I think that's fine. But I wouldn't put like that spelling bee that you finished in second place in second, you know, in sixth grade. Weirdly specific because that's me. Um, can we put details about an activity in the additional info section if we've written about it in a supplemental essay? Sure. In fact, that's sometimes a good strategy because yeah. in your supplemental essay, maybe you want to focus on more a more creative take on it or a particular aspect of it. You may not have in the application otherwise like those concrete details about like here's yeah. the students served and all the impact stuff that we did. So I want to just encourage you. Yes, feel free to do that as long as it's not super redundant. A little repetition is okay. You don't want to make it super redundant. Uh, Tom, do you see questions? There's like a little Q and A tab there. On um, are the bolded ones ones that have already been done? It's so funny. I'm actually working from the Q and A only thing okay. there. But let me jump to that. Well, I'm going to skip those just in case those are bolded for a special reason. Bolded usually means we've already done yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so Helen asks, what percentage of the 70 percent ish of the deferred candidates for Harvard who end up in regular decision end up getting in? Um, and Helen, I don't have the stats for Harvard off the top of my head. I did not work there. Um, but in general, um, and I know actually, you know, we've had conversations with our college counselors who work with college essay guys. So we are very privileged to have lots of amazing folks who work at independent schools across the U.S. who are doing independent stuff, who work full time for our team. Um, and, you know, kind of we're definitely getting a lot of um, feedback that this particular year, many schools that would have deferred a lot of students, um, particularly some of the Ivy League schools, some of those really highly rejected schools. Um, are being a little more choosy this year than they have been historically with defers. And actually, as someone who works in admissions, I am, I'm glad to hear that because even though it's, it means more pain and more closed doors instead of ajar doors, it is more healthy, I think, for the students who really the school only feels are going to be competitive 
to be in the running in that deferral stage. So I don't exactly know if, you know, Harvard's rate this year is 70% as it has been similarly ish for the past two or so years. Um, but in general at those schools, it tends to be probably, I would say about 10, maybe 20% ish of, of students who are admitted um, from uh, the deferral round to the regular decision round. So the math is not the kindest and the numbers are not the prettiest to look at. Um, so again, prioritizing and opening up the excitement and enthusiasm for other schools um, is definitely the healthiest way to, to shift and move on from that, that decision. Yeah. Somebody's asking, Tan's asking about uh, what's different for, well, actually, you know what, Before, I'm going to answer that one in the chat. I'll answer your question in the chat, Tan. Someone just asked, any advice for applying to Pomona from Ariana? <laughs> Ariana, that's a great one. I worked there, so sure. Um, Pomona is a school that really values intellectual curiosity. Um, and that's a buzzword you hear a lot in admissions, but I really would encourage you, Ariana, in your essays to write about the things that kind of like you go on Wikipedia rabbit holes about. This is something that when I worked and did information sessions for Pomona, I would try to use examples like that a lot to show the things that keep you up at night, that you constantly are just like curious about how do these things intersect? Um, how can I contribute to a cause or a goal that I have for society or the world at large? Um, it can be definitely okay to be a little aspirational with these um, while also identifying specific elements of Pomona that really allow you to achieve those goals. I think getting at the why, why are you interested in what you're interested in? What is the motivation behind it? And what do you hope to solve? Those are some questions that I, I would encourage you to ask yourself in your application. And this goes for a lot of schools beyond Pomona too. Um, but for Pomona specifically, I would say two big things that they really look for in candidates are intellectual curiosity. Um, I would say investment in community is another big one, a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion in some way, shape, or form. Um, and or um, liberal arts fit, which by that I mean you are not like, I only care about one academic subject, the rest of it is crap and I don't want to do any of it. Obviously, if you communicate that, it shows that maybe a liberal arts college like Pomona, where you will be dabbling in lots of areas while identifying a major to focus on, is maybe not the best place for you. Um, so communicating that you like to intersect different um, academic subjects is what I would recommend touching on some way in your app. Mahavir asks, does a student need to have national level recognition awards in extracurriculars for Ivy slash highly rejective schools? And I'll say what probably most, you know, folks on our side will say to you. Actually, I would say most admission officers will probably tell you is like, it depends. And it depends. I mean, like, certainly it's kind of like the additional info advice we gave you. Certainly there are students who are accepted into highly rejective schools that do not have national level recognition. But the thing that most reps will probably tell you is that we look at applications holistically. In other words, what, and if you're looking for like, what do the colleges value most? Most times it's grades. And then underneath that, it's like everything else. And it used to be test scores, but like, you know, that, now that they're optional, it's sort of like they're looking at, obviously they're looking at like the rigor of your curriculum, but they're looking at your essays. They're looking at your recommendation letters. They're looking at your level of involvement in extracurriculars. Um, so those things are great, but it's not going to probably be a make or break thing. Like, in other words, unless it's like, unless it's like Olympics, you know, if you like perform, if you were like an Olympic athlete, yes, that will sometimes give you a bump at certain schools, especially they'll be like, oh yes, for sure. You are level five extracurriculars, depending on how they, you know, look at the application. Um, but it's probably going to be one of many things that they consider, mm -hmm. not a must have and not a deal breaker if you don't have it. I spotted a good question from Alex about potentially using a, the additional information for a second essay. Has it, has Ooh, it okay. yes. Let's talk about that. So Alex, I'm really glad you asked this because that is not something that we would actually recommend. Um, and it's not something that typically admissions officers will be really enthused or it will be really helpful for your candidacy. Sometimes students are like, gee, like I wrote this amazing you know, supplemental essay or scholarship essay or something that I wanted to slide in here and make sure that every school that I've applied to gets. Um, and especially if it is somewhat similar to a second personal statement, it's not necessarily maximizing or utilizing that space the way that it's intended to be. Um, that space is meant to be to explain additional circumstances in your life that may have contributed to your academic performance, your trajectory as a student. Um, it's to elaborate on activities or elements of your candidacy that you didn't quite have the chance to elaborate on given space constraints and word counts. Um, but it's not necessarily a place to tell an entirely new story. It should not be an actual story, I would say. You know, you can definitely fold in maybe some elements of touch points and narrative, but it, this part of the app does tend to be a little more fact-based for less of a better word and a little more of bullets. Um, it can be written in paragraph form, that's fine. Um, but generally it's kind of like the nuts and bolts 
of what you've done and circumstances behind that. So what Ethan shared before about potentially if you want to write about an extracurricular activity for a supplemental essay, zooming in on a moment where you really worked with a kid that you were tutoring and kind of illustrating your qualities and values through that scenario. And then outlining in the additional info, if you want to give more nuts and bolts around how many kids you served, all those kind of like more pragmatic, you know, lab report-esque <laughs> details, um, that is kind of the best way to approach that. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, somebody asked, can we include, Timmy Tayo is asking, can we include an activity that we've only just started? I think so. I mean, I, I yeah. think that, it, again, it's not going to be like a make or break thing. Like if you don't include it, it's not the end of the world. But sure, if it's something that, especially if it's like connected to something that you care about, yeah. I mean, don't feel like it, there, there are two schools of thought on this. There's like put absolutely everything. And then some people are like only put the essentials. And I think finding the middle ground that's comfortable for you is really great. And I think, again, st some students get accepted into schools with like three activities and some students have 10 and then they are overflowing. So they put more in the additional info. Some students will put things that are like, no, only the things that I spent like more than 10 hours a week on. And other people are like, you know what? Yeah, I did this one day thing, but it was really awesome. And it helps show this other side of me. Great. So I think it's just sort of like, there's not a right answer for that. And if I, if it were me, like, I think I would personally, if I was doing the applications, I would want to include a little more information. So those things that were like, you're saying to me, tell you like something that you just started, but that you're trying to get some energy around. Yeah. I'd say put it, but you could talk to another counselor and they can be like, no, only put your top, I don't know, four or five things, but mm -hmm. it's, so it's, I know that I'm not perfectly answering it. I'm giving you like a preference and saying like, it's your call, but I don't think you're going to make a wrong call. Mm -hmm. You want uh, to do one more? Or, let's, yeah, let's do one more. Uh, I see one in the chat that I feel like is a good one to end on. Um, it's, hello everyone, I'm Parth Tiwari from India. Hi Parth. Um, what should the strategy be for regular decisions? Applying to all IVs or just applying to one or two selective colleges? <laughs> and I'm really glad you asked this, um, Parth, because I think that that is a, um, a thought that may be on a lot of students' mind who maybe you are a senior and maybe you did get deferred from your top choice and maybe it was an IV or a highly rejected selective school. Um, I think leaning into kind of maybe that panic that may be behind kind of feeling like you want to just throw them all into your process and, you know, hope that math wise, one of them will take me. Um, that term is often referred to as like shotgunning with your college application list. Um, I really try to caution students against that. Um, and the reason why is because um, putting together a really Kick butt application takes time and it takes thought and it takes reflection many times you know and we're really big on ease purpose and joy at college essay guys so you can recalibrate and reuse you know super essays with tweaks and modifications to make them individual from school to school but a lot of times it does involve time energy investment you have to research the colleges that you are applying to you can't just say i'm applying to you because they're an ivy that's not going to help you at all um so really kind of thinking, you know, if you are reevaluating your list at this stage, you didn't get into your top choice school, um, really kind of focusing, I'd say more on those target and likely schools, if you are going to make modifications for your list, and being choosy with your reaches. Um, those are the applications you want to spend a lot of time on, you want to spend a lot, put a lot of thought into them. Um, and the shotgunning approach, um, as tempting as it can be, especially because if they have, if you are an international student, and maybe you, you know, uh, for some of the students I know on the call, um, finances are something that is a big piece of their process and you're thinking about. So you're like, hey, the, all these schools that have full name packages for me and don't look at finances or need blind, like I want to put my hat in the ring at a lot of those schools. If that happens to be your situation, you know, having a list that's a little higher on um, highly rejected schools does make a little more sense. But for a lot of other students, I'd say the majority of students who are applying to colleges in the US, um, kind of having a list that has all those schools and, and is really heavy on that is going to burn you out um, and kind of just suck a lot of joy and, and meaning out of your life at this stage when you are just leading into your last year of high school and like hopefully having time to recharge and rethink and and, and everything. So um, we definitely want to make sure that you continue like living your life to the fullest right now um, instead of siphoning it and having college eat it all away. Yeah, that's beautiful to end on. Thank you, Tom. And thanks, friends, for being here. And, and you know, reach out to us if we can help. If you've got questions, you can always email us at help at College Essay Guy. And, um, yeah, we wish you a, a happy close to your year. And we'll be back soon with more content. Stay tuned. on Stay on the email list. If, you're, if this is your first event, hey, and you're, you know, wherever you're at in the college journey, we want to we be here and support. So talk to you all soon. Throw yourself a chocolate party this weekend for yourself just because. <laughs> just because. Love cause. yourself. Just because. Yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Bye, everyone. Bye, friends. I have to do this awkward 15 second pause because sometimes when I hit stop, it just like totally cuts off. So I'm just going to like hang out here for a few seconds and then we'll maybe edit the video later or maybe we'll forget to edit the video later. You're so welcome. Thanks for being here, y'all. Thanks for joining. Thanks for staying up till three in the morning, Alex. That's that's rad. I'm grateful. Happy holidays to you all. Okay, I think I'm probably safe and I can hit stop now. <laughs> Bye, y'all.